Okay, this is chapter one, Introduction to Fluid Mechanics, part four, Surface Tension. In this video, I'll be continuing to talk about fluid properties. In particular, I'll be talking about surface tension. As you'll see, surface tension leads to some interesting phenomena. If there's a solid surface involved, the kind of behavior you get depends upon the wettability of that surface. So I'll be explaining a bit about wettability, and I'll end by talking about capillary effects, which is, for example, when water is drawn up a tube by the surface tension force. In the textbook by White, surface tension is represented by the uppercase Greek letter upsilon. As you probably know, surface tension is the force that causes small liquid drops and bubbles to tend to form into spheres. There's a tension in the surface, a bit like the rubber membrane in a balloon. But of course, there isn't really a membrane at the surface. It's just the result of the cohesion of closely spaced liquid molecules, which we discussed in a previous video. But even though a surface membrane doesn't exist, it can be modeled mathematically as an elastic membrane, as I've shown over here. So surface tension has the units of newtons per meter or pounds per foot. This is the force per unit length of the fictitious membrane. And I've drawn a small section of the liquid surface here, and I've shown a cut section of the membrane, and the cut section here is of length L. So the force needed to hold that surface in place is the surface tension times the length, epsilon times L. Now at a water-air interface, the surface tension is about 70 millinewtons per meter. That's a small force, but it's enough to support the weight of a water strider insect or a small metal object at the interface. As I mentioned, surface tension is caused by the cohesive force between adjacent liquid molecules. I've drawn a sketch of the surface of a liquid droplet here. Molecules that are in the interior of the droplet, so well away from the interface, are pulled more or less uniformly in all directions by the surrounding molecules. They're attracted to their neighbors in all directions. But if we look at molecules at the surface, molecules that are right at the surface are pulled sideways and inward. There's not a lot of outward force because molecules of the gas are much farther apart. They're widely dispersed. And in fact, we've discussed this in a previous video. That's what characterizes a gas. So this force balance on the surface molecules creates a tendency for the gas-liquid interface to curve and contract under tension. And you've seen that droplets of water want to form spheres. Surface tension also produces a pressure difference across the curved gas-liquid interface, much like the skin of a rubber balloon makes the pressure inside the balloon higher than on the outside. And we'll do a calculation of what's called capillary pressure, the pressure difference across that interface, later in this video. You can find data on the surface tension of water in air in the appendix of your textbook. Here I've shown the table from your textbook, which gives the surface tension of water at various temperatures. Generally speaking, surface tension decreases as temperature increases. So, for example, you're more likely to be able to place a paperclip on the surface of a glass of water if you use cold water rather than warm water. The data in that table assumes that you have clean water. I should mention that surface tension is strongly affected by chemical contaminants, such as detergents. Detergents reduce the surface tension of water significantly. In fact, that's the purpose of detergents when you wash your clothes. It reduces the surface tension so the water can penetrate fully into all the nooks and crannies of the fabric. This video shows droplets of water on wax paper, and the droplets have been colored with food coloring. The tip of the toothpick has a little bit of 
dishwashing detergent on it. And you can see quite dramatically how a tiny bit of soap instantly destroys the surface tension. I mentioned earlier that surface tension acts like a membrane, much like the membrane on a rubber balloon, causing the pressure inside of a droplet to increase. And as you'll see for small droplets, the pressure inside the droplet can become very large. This is an example of calculating that effect. The question asks, what is the pressure inside a droplet of water with a radius of half a millimeter at 20 degrees C? And you're told to ignore the effects of gravity and that the local pressure is 100.3 kPa. So here's the solution. First, we consider a free body diagram on half of the droplet. So what I've shown over here is a free body diagram on the lower half of the droplet. So we've cut it in two and we've placed the forces at this surface here. So we have two forces at work. One is the pressure force, which acts over the cross-sectional area of the droplet. And that's balanced by the interfacial tension in the droplet's skin. And remember, surface tension is force per unit length. So to get the total force in this interface, we need to take the surface tension times the length of the interface. And the length of the interface is their circumference, so it's epsilon times 2 pi r. So this is just a simple statics problem, that the sum of the forces in the vertical direction equals zero. So the pressure force balances the total surface tension force in the droplet skin. As we discussed, the pressure force acts over the cross-sectional area of the droplet, pi r squared here. And the surface tension force, which is the force per unit length, acts over the droplet perimeter, which is 2 pi r. And you can check my algebra here. You can see that if you solve for delta p, you get that the pressure inside of a little droplet of water is two times the surface tension divided by the radius of the droplet. So I've reproduced that result here. Delta P equals 2 epsilon divided by R. And you're told in the problem statement that the radius of the droplet is half a millimeter. So now you can go to your appendix, table A5, and look up the surface tension of a water-air interface at 20 degrees C. And it's 0 0.0728 newtons per meter. And now it's just a matter of making the substitutions. 2 times the surface tension divided by the radius of the droplet, being careful to notice that that's half a millimeter. And you can see that the units work out. Newtons per meter squared is pressure. And we get 291 newtons per meter squared, which is 0 0.291 kilopascals. So that's the pressure difference between the inside and the outside of the droplet. The inside of the droplet is 291 pascals above atmospheric pressure. The question asks for the pressure inside the droplet. To get the absolute pressure inside the droplet, you want to add on the atmospheric pressure. So the atmospheric pressure, you're told in the problem statement, is 100.3 kilopascals. And you add on this 0.291 kilopascals. And I've done a little rounding here. So the answer is that the pressure inside the small droplet of water is 100.6 kilopascals. Now, there's a curious thing about this equation here. You can see, looking at this equation, that as the droplet gets smaller and smaller, the pressure goes up and up, and it can become very, very large. And in fact, as the radius of the droplet goes to zero, as that droplet evaporates and starts to disappear, that equation says that the delta P across the interface goes to infinity. Now, do you think that's reality? Is that what really happens? Take a moment and think about this. Maybe pause the video. The answer is no. The pressure inside the droplet doesn't become infinite. This analysis is based on the continuum approximation. And we talked about the continuum approximation in one of the first videos in this course. As the droplet gets smaller and smaller, at some point, the continuum approximation will break down. 
So once the radius of the droplet approaches the size of a water molecule, this analysis is no longer valid. So this is just a mathematical singularity because of the assumptions that are built into this analysis. Next, we'll consider the surface tension in a flat soap film. What you're seeing here is a flat soap film across a large hoop. So what's happening here is you're seeing a, a loop of thread placed onto the soap film. And when you poke out the center of the thread, when you poke the film out of the center of the thread, the thread stretches into a nearly perfect circle. Of course, that's a lovely example of the surface tension that acts radially on that loop of thread. Now, the total radial surface tension force on that thread is going to be 4 pi r times the surface tension. So 2 times the circumference times the surface tension. Now, let me ask you this. Why not 2 pi r times the surface tension? Maybe you could pause the video for a moment and think about this. The answer is that there are two interfaces to consider. If you consider the cross section of the thread shown here, here we have the cross section of the thread and the soap film. A soap film has two gas liquid interfaces. So we have 2 pi r times the surface tension on the top surface and 2 pi r times the surface tension on the bottom surface. Uh, so the total radial force on that loop of thread is 4 pi r times the surface tension. For this same reason, the pressure drop across a soap bubble is two times the pressure drop across a droplet of soap. We did this analysis before. We found that the pressure drop across the interface of a liquid droplet was two times the surface tension upon r but because a soap bubble has two interfaces, the pressure drop across the interface of a soap bubble is four times the surface tension divided by R. You get twice as much pressure rise across that interface. Next, I'm going to talk about surface wettability. When you put a liquid on a surface, you get quite different behaviors depending upon the wettability of the surface. For so-called hydrophobic surfaces, like this lotus leaf, water is more attracted to itself than the surface. So the water forms individual droplets. And if you looked at the contact line here, where the water meets the leaf, you'd see that the contact angle, defined over here, was greater than 90 degrees. Theta greater than 90 degrees is the characteristic of a non-wetted surface. So you could roll the water droplet off the leaf, and the leaf would be completely dry. But on most surfaces, water is more attracted to the surface than to itself, like on the unwaxed hood of a car. In this case, if you looked at the contact angle where the water meets the hood, you'd find that the contact angle was less than 90 degrees. So when theta is less than 90 degrees, the liquid wets the surface and it tends to form a continuous film. In fact, that's how goggle defogger works. What you're basically doing is adding a chemical contaminant to the surface of your ski goggles or scuba goggles, and this reduces the contact angle of the water droplets. So the condensation forms a film that can be more easily seen through than the cloud of individual droplets that obscure your view. Surface tension is also the cause of capillary reaction. If you have a tube that gets wetted by the liquid, in other words, a liquid solid pair with a contact angle less than 90 degrees, then the liquid will be drawn up into the tube. And in fact, that's how an ordinary kitchen sponge works. The sponge is wetted by the water and it gets drawn up into all the small holes by surface tension. It's also the cause of a meniscus in a graduated cylinder. You might remember in chemistry labs, you were told to measure from the bottom of the meniscus since water wets the glass. But if you have a non-wetting pair, 
then the fluid is drawn downwards, as I've shown here. That happens, for example, with a mercury barometer, because mercury doesn't wet glass. So in that case, you have to read the barometer from the top of the meniscus. In one of the next videos, I'll do the analysis and a calculation of the capillary effect in a round tube. So be sure to watch that video. This becomes a slight issue in chapter two. In chapter two, we're going to use the height that liquid rises up a tube to measure pressure. And as we will discuss, this pressure is just the specific weight of the liquid times the height of the column of liquid. And we'll be using instruments called manometers and piezometers to measure pressure in this way. In these instruments, the tubes have been made sufficiently large that capillary effects are negligible. And that works out to be roughly five millimeters or larger in diameter. And so in chapter two, we will assume that capillary effects are negligible for these types of measurements. You may have heard the expression that liquids always find their own level. Well, because of capillary effects, that's only true for tubes with sufficiently large diameter. As you can see here, water can be drawn up small bore tubes a very long way. I thought I'd end by showing you something interesting related to surface tension. This is called Marangoni droplet bursting. This happens when you put a droplet that's a mixture of alcohol and water on a layer of oil. The alcohol evaporates more rapidly near the edges of the droplet, so you have a higher concentration of alcohol at the center uh, than at the edges. And alcohol has a lower surface tension than water, so that sets up a surface tension gradient. And this surface tension difference drives a flow from the center to the outside of the droplet. And you get this beautiful bursting effect. As far as I know, Marangoni droplet bursting has no practical applications. I just think it looks cool. And that completes this presentation.